All right, welcome everyone. Uh, really, really excited to see all of you here today and to tell you a little bit more about research, what it involves, uh, and why it could be useful as you think about applying to university and, and beyond. Uh, to give you a bit of context before we dive into the gory details, uh, we always like to start with a story. So a quick bit of background about me is I grew up in Chennai, which is a city in South India that you see on the map there. It's a very quiet city and, and growing up, I really didn't know much about research. Um, in fact, I don't think I knew a single person who had a PhD. And so for me, the way that I started exploring um, topics in the social sciences was through competitive debating. So I debated uh, for India at the World Schools Debating Championships. And through that, I started to explore topics like why some countries were developed and other countries weren't, um, what the causes of religious conflict were and how we could prevent it, uh, what causes technological innovation and, and how countries uh, could improve the amount of innovation that they have. And I found these absolutely fascinating. Um, and I wanted to dig deeper, but didn't have very many opportunities to do that in high school. And so decided that I needed to apply to university abroad, uh, ended up applying to the US where I did my bachelor's degree in economics um, at Harvard and, and had a fabulous four years there. But even there for the first couple of years of, the, of my time at Harvard, um, I found myself knocking on the doors of professors to try and get access to research opportunities, only to be told, you know, you're a fresher, you're a second year student, what can you add to our research projects? And so it took a bit of trying, but it changed the summer after my second year of university when I did a structured research program at the Harvard Business School, where I was matched one on one with a professor and I got to work with them on a research project that, that they were taking on. And I found that mind blowing. The idea that I could spend my time thinking about these big problems in the world, how to understand them and how to make them better. And that other people would actually care enough to listen and, and hear what I have to say was fascinating to me. And so that really changed the trajectory of my life. I ended up uh, applying to Oxford where I did my MPhil in development studies at St. John's College. Uh, and I'm now pursuing a DPhil, which is a PhD at, at Oxford as well. But that summer also changed my trajectory in another way. I met Stephen, who is the, the other young man you see on the screen there. And unlike me, Stephen came from sort of a lineage of researchers. He um, was the son of a professor at a business school in the US. And his great grandfather, Fritz Kahn, had been a prominent public intellectual in Germany, whose book you see on the screen. And in fact, when Fritz had to flee Germany because of the Holocaust, um, the person who wrote the letter that got him into the U.S. as a refugee was none other than Albert Einstein. So that's the kind of background of researchers that Stephen comes from, and, and research is nothing new to him. For him, though, that research program that we did together offered something else, which was an opportunity to get mentorship. And so he worked with uh, professors that he ended up turning to for feedback, for inspiration, for support, all through his college career and beyond. And that's how he ended up being impacted through the experience of research. And so when Stephen and I started talking together many, many years after we graduated from Harvard, we realized that we had found that research was really, really meaningful in our lives and that we would have loved to have done it sooner. We thought back to the nerdy 17 year olds that we'd been in high school and figured this was an opportunity that you know we would have killed to have when we were in high school and that simply still didn't exist many years down. So that's the context in which we started Lumiere. And uh, Lumiere is a selective research program for high school students around the world. I'm going to tell you a bit more about it closer to the end of, of this session. But the goal of this background was to give you a bit of context as to why I'm here talking to all of you, as well as to sort of nudge you in the direction of thinking about research, not just as something that helps with college applications, but something that can truly be life changing and affect how you think about the world and the decisions you make moving forward. So given that, I would love to go around the room and do introductions, but I think that might end up taking longer than we have. So I'd love if you could put in the chat if what areas you're interested in doing research in. So this could be as specific as saying, I'm interested in you know, the genetic markers that cause sickle cell anemia, or it could be as broad as saying, I'm interested in history or I'm interested in Latin. 
So use the chat and, and send over um, what you think if I put a gun to your head and said you had to do research right now, what you would be, what you would do research in. I think you should be able to message biomechanics and cricket. That is fascinating. I don't think we've ever had someone do research in that area before, but it's really, really cool. Um, as well as uh, um, uh, aeronautical engineering. We have another design and engineering, which is really interesting. I love the things that you're applying it to cricket, origami, really um, innovative and, and, and interesting uh, uh, areas. Reagan says medicine. Are there any others? Fabulous, the law and ethics. So as you look at the kinds of things that people are interested in in the chat, you see law, you see medicine, you see design, you see biomechanics. And a very reasonable question to ask is, what does it even mean to say research when we're talking about research across such different disciplines? And this is something that we at Lumiere have thought really, really hard about because we do have students who've done research in all of these areas and more. And so to us, we think of research as a process and it's a process that results in the creation of a tiny piece of new human knowledge that helps us understand the world a bit better. And it's a process that starts with curiosity. So you begin with looking at the world around you, looking at the human body, looking at outer space and thinking, what's that thing that I don't fully get? What's that thing that makes me go, hmm, I don't, I don't quite understand that. I find that kind of curious. The next step after that is to dig deep into that topic and learn as much as you can about that topic. And the reason for that is because you don't want to waste your time duplicating efforts that other researchers have done. Say an apple falls on my head, I find that really curious. I go away and do research and come back to you all and say, you know what, I've just discovered this cool new thing called gravity. None of you would be impressed with me because we all know that gravity exists and other people have discovered it. So what you need to first do is go away and read up about this thing that you're curious about so that you can then identify the gaps. What is it that we still don't understand about this topic? What have other researchers missed? Using that, you frame a research question and you develop your own analysis and, 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 and uh, think through it to create an argument of your own that helps answer that research question. And people think that that's when research ends, but actually that's when the hardest part starts for a lot of people, because after you've done that analysis and developed your point of view, you then need to write it out in a way that's clear, that makes sense, that's easily understandable, and get it out into, into the world, present it to others, try and publish it, send it out in the form of articles and blog posts to try and change other people's minds. And so that process that starts with curiosity and exploration to analysis and writing up is what we describe as research. And now what I wanna dive into is that third step because I've said we can do analysis, but we haven't really talked about what that analysis might look like. So we're gonna talk about that in just a second, but I wanna pause and see if there are any questions at all. I know that this is a lot of pretty dense material and, and I'm glad that you're all here and, and listening in. You're certainly far more advanced than I was when I was in school. Um, but if you have any questions at all, please feel free to put them in the chat or in the Q&A um, and I'm happy to answer them as I go along. Fantastic. So here's where I'm gonna ask you guys to pitch in. So that first column there, lab-based research, is I think what comes to mind when most people say research. So they, you think of these people in white lab coats who are mixing up chemicals and causing something to explode. And that's a really, really important kind of research, no questions asked. And it's super important in physics, chemistry, medicine, biology, psychology, all of these places where you need to create carefully controlled experiments to test a hypothesis. However, that is by no means the only kind of research that you can do. And in fact, for high school students, it's actually quite a hard type of research to do because you might not have access to the labs that you need. And you also might not have the skills needed to use the instruments and equipment in a lab, even if you get access to it. 
So I want to talk about three other kinds of research that you can do um, from the comfort of your own home using just your computer uh, if you're interested. So the second type of research is called quantitative research. When I say the word quantitative, what kind of data do you think quantitative researchers use to make their arguments or present their point of view? Feel free to throw it in the chat. So Daniel says opinions. I don't know if opinions are quantitative. Sarah, I think that's a lot closer. So quantitative researchers use numerical data and there's tons of numerical data all around us. There's the census that governments do, which has information on every single person in the country, their age, their income, their um, number of people in their family and so on and so forth. You have um, numerical data from businesses which have information on their inventory and how many, um, uh, how many pieces of a particular product they've sold and so on. You've got numerical data in, the, in physics where the Hubble Space Telescope creates output on the positions of different stars and how far away they are from each other and, and all of that that you can access. You have it in, in biology where there's enormous amounts of genetic data which talks about different genes and the characteristics that they're associated with and the numbers of people that have them. And so all of this numerical data, what's used by quantitative researchers who use statistical tools like Python or R to analyze this data and try and find patterns within these numbers. Do certain variables move up and down together? Do they affect each other? And through that, they make their arguments for how the world works. So that's a super common method used across the sciences, but also in certain um, quantitative social sciences like economics, political science, and business. And once again, this is something that you could do literally just having access to a computer. The flip side of quantitative research is qualitative research. So if quantitative researchers use numerical data, what are some things that qualitative researchers might use? Observations, um, that's, that's a really good one. Anything else that qualitative researchers might use? Opinions, yep. Recordings, I love that one. I think you guys are exactly on the right track. So qualitative researchers make use of this universe of non-numerical data that exists. That can be opinions that you get by talking to people and doing interviews of focus groups. It could be physical artifacts like fossils or um, you can imagine someone studying uh, 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 artifacts. Um, it could be observations. So you just sit and watch people around you and make uh, observations about their behavior. It could be audio recordings like music or speeches by people. It could be video recordings of movies or advertisements or whatever else. It could be pictures. So um, in art history, for instance, or for those who are studying old posters, um, it could be documents in the form of uh, government policy documents or archives. All of these are things that qualitative researchers use. And they're looking through these things once again, trying to find patterns within this data that helps them understand the world better. And then they present that in the, in, in, in the form of a qualitative research paper. And this is really common in the humanities and English and history, but also in, in some of the qualitative social sciences like anthropology or sociology. Finally, all three of the things that we've talked about so far, lab-based research, quantitative research, and qualitative research, all make use of data, just data of different kinds. In comparison, a systematic literature review doesn't use data of its own, rather it uses existing academic work to try and synthesize it and present a point of view. So someone doing a systematic literature review might read you know, 20, 30 different papers in the field and present a paper that summarizes all of those different points of view and, and, and explains what the state of the field is and uses those existing papers to make an argument of its own. So that's what a literature review looks like. And it's a really valuable type of paper that helps uh, a lay person or, or someone who's new to the field understand what's going on in that area. And what I find interesting is that I think people don't think about those three latter forms of research very much. And yet for someone who's in your position, who's thinking about doing research, I think those are definitely the more accessible versions, especially if you're starting out and haven't done research before.
So a very reasonable question then is why do research? And I think I have hopefully um, explained some of the reasons why research is awesome for you guys. The fact that it helps you explore an area you might be interested in. It helps you build skills. It helps you understand the world better and make the world a better place. But I also know that you guys are in school and thinking about applying to universities. Um, and, and it's quite important that what you do right now helps you in that next step, whether that's that's um, an internship, a summer program, uh, 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 apl applications to universities or whatever else. And I think research is something that can really, really help set you apart, especially when you're applying to competitive Russell Group universities um, or to the US. And the reason is because I think research helps in a couple of different things. The first is that it helps showcase academic excellence. So when you do research and write a paper, you know, anyone can say they're interested in law or anyone can say they're interested in physics. Very few people can talk in detail in their UCAS essay or in their interview about a research paper that they have written that, that has made use of evidence and demonstrates the level of investment and engagement they have in that topic. So I think in terms of showcasing your academic chops, um, there's nothing like a research paper to help you do that. The second is that you also, especially in a uh, mentored program like Lumia, you work with a top researcher. And so by doing that, you build a relationship with someone that you can turn to for advice. Should I apply to the uh, to PPE at Oxford or should I apply to um, economics and management at Oxford? Should I apply to uh, a, a program that is more hands-on or should I apply to a program that's more theoretical? Those are the kinds of questions that, that you can ask a mentor that I think are really valuable. But you can also go beyond that. And if you build a good relationship with your mentor and and do good work with them, even ask them to write you a recommendation letter and there are universities that accept an additional recommendation letter beyond the ones that come from your school teachers. And I think that could be a really valuable way of speaking to your um, abilities and experience. And finally, you get to demonstrate university readiness because universities aren't just looking for people who are very smart. They're looking for people who are ready to take on the challenges of university. And research is all about preparing you for that. So of course, when you do research, you are learning how to read and write academically and think critically, which is super valuable. You are also learning how to manage your time and manage a project because you are taking on something intensive alongside school or over break and that you need to plan in advance for and know how to do. That's something that immediately affects um, how you perform at university as well when you're given so much independence and asked to take your own decisions. Um, it also helps in terms of learning how to come to, to face failure and overcome it because when you're trying to do research, you will struggle. You will try approaches that don't work and you have to find ways around it to bounce back and, and improve your work. And that's something that once again at university, you will inevitably face and that you will be expected to figure out how to do on your own. So in terms of those very various different skills that you need to succeed at university, I think research helps you showcase those and, and can, can help uh, convince universities that you're someone who will flourish at, uh, at, a, at a top research university. I'll pause there. Do you guys have any questions about this so far? So Mary, what, you say, what kind of examples would you suggest? What do you mean by that? To include in a personal statement, good question. So I think a personal statement, especially one that includes research, needs to include three things. The first thing it needs to include is why did you do that research project? What are the things you read, that you thought about, that you experienced, that instilled an interest in you that made you want to try and do the research? Because without that, it feels like you just did this research for the sake of college applications. And I know that that's not true for, for any of you. So you could explain how you came to that interest by talking about personal experiences that you had in your life, books that you've read, online courses you've done, um, or uh, classes that you've taken at school. So once you establish that interest that, that you develop, you can then, the second step is to explain the content of the research project that you did. And in that, I think it's very, very important to be specific and quantify it. So what that means is if you simply say, I did research on, you know, 
uh, the environment, that's not as convincing as you being able to say, I did research on the impact of, you know, uh, chemical effluents from uh, uh, paint companies on the, on the X river in Bangladesh. So when you're able to talk about it in that level of detail, that shows you've actually done the research that you've actually done something meaningful. The second aspect of that is quantification, which is not just saying I did research, but being able to say things like I read over 40 um, uh, academic papers in preparation for this. I analyzed a data set with over 2 million data points. I did an interview or a survey that had over 150 respondents. All of those quantifications can really get across to the person who's reading your statement of purpose or your resume, the, the magnitude of the work that you did. And the final step is to say, what happened after? So not just that you did this research and it, it hung, in, hung there in midair, but that you thought about it, you reflected on it, you digested it, and then took it forward in some way. And that could be just taking it forward in terms of developing your interests and explaining how that results in um, what you want to study at university. But it could also be that you took it forward by doing more research, or you took it forward by doing an internship, or you took it forward by presenting it to uh, younger students at your school. Whatever it is, being able to demonstrate that you have done this experience and gained skills and knowledge from it is really valuable. I see two questions in the chat. So there's a question that says, does an EPQ count as a systematic literature review research? I think it does, but I think an EPQ by itself is good, but it's not as helpful as having done something outside of school as well. Because if you think about it, when you apply to the Oxfords and Cambridges of the world, you're competing against tons of applicants who've written EPQs. And so you being able to say, I did this EPQ at school, I liked it, but I also went above and beyond that to write something on my own outside of school, I think demonstrates that edge that you've got over others. Reagan asks, is there a lot of research in biomedicine? Absolutely. I think that's an area in which there's a huge, huge amount of research to be done. Um, I think if you have specific areas within that that you're curious about, put them in the chat and I can try and see um, what I know about them. Uh, of course, with the caveat that the last biology class I took was in 10th grade. So any answers that I give you are based on my experience working with students at Lumiere and not my own coursework. Um, but I think you can do a lot of literature reviews around specific diseases and how we respond to them. I think there's research on this quantitative research using experimental data that's already out there. And you could even think about doing research from a public health perspective that's more qualitative, say using interviews and so on. Mariam, the question about how to prepare for the BMAT, I'm really not the right person to ask. I think that's something that you could email the folks at uni admissions about. Um, what are the unique factors that slims your chance of getting uh, into a Russell Group University? Really good question. I think the first thing is if you are not academically prepared and strong, that is absolutely a red flag to them that you will not be uh, able to compete successfully at this university. So being able to show that you have read up, that you've done well in school, that you've gone above and beyond and taken on other academic uh, opportunities, I think is really important. The second thing that slims your chance of getting into a Russell Group University is if it comes across like you are saying things in simply or you've said or done things simply in order to get into university. So this speaks to what I was discussing earlier, which is you need to explain why you did something and how it impacted you. Simply saying, you know, I wrote a research paper um, in of itself doesn't add as much value as you being able to explain your thinking and knowledge behind it. So I think those two are the biggest things and, and are um, red flags that students don't think as much about as they should. Fantastic. So you, you, you've decided that you want to do research, but you're not entirely sure how best to do it and, and what, how to think about it in the context of your high school career. And I want to present three ways of thinking about research that I think can be quite valuable. So the first option is you can use research to go deeper into an area of interest that you already have and create a spike. So this is an example of a student from uh, India who did research, uh, who came into the Lumiere program 
with two very clear interests. He was very interested in machine learning. He'd already done a fair bit of uh, computer science, had learned Python on his own, and was interested in doing something in machine learning with a view towards applying to computer science programs at university. But he was also a pro tennis player. So he was representing tennis. Uh, he, I think he was playing tennis for his school estate and, and had, had many, many years of experience doing it. And so what he decided to do was to use the Lumia Research Scholar Program and his research experience as a way of combining the two and deepening his expertise in machine learning. And so he wrote a research paper that took data on professional tennis matches uh, from a, a different period, of, uh, from a, a specific period of time, and then created a machine learning predictive algorithm that tried to see how the handedness of a player, so whether a player is left or right handed, um, affected the likelihood that they win a particular match and how that changed based on uh, the background of the player, which level the player was playing at, um, and so on and so forth. So this was a, a really interesting uh, topic area that helped him strengthen his interests and experience in computer science. And he went on to then do a couple of things. So he uh, published his work at the International Journal of High School Research and also reached out to uh, people at the Harvard Sports Analysis Collective, who are a student-run club that look at using data analytics for sports, and reached out to them with the, um, uh, the goal of writing a blog post for them. So I think that's a really clear way of taking an interest that you have and digging deep into it using research to really strengthen how that comes across in the context of a college application. The second option is to use research as a way to round out your profile. So some students, you know, don't have that strong academic background already. And maybe you have a lot of other strengths that you are um, a, a competitive debater or model United Nations uh, uh, participant. Maybe you are in student government and your head boy um, of your school. And in that context, maybe you haven't been able to dig as deep into an academic area as you would have liked, given all of these other commitments on your time. I think the research paper in this context can be a way to um, exp explore an area, see if it's right for you, and then use that as a way to demonstrate interest in that field. And so this is an example of a student who um, was a fabulous all-rounder. She was um, a competitive manner, was on her student government, uh, but but used the Lumiere project to demonstrate that she also was skilled at um, uh, 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 her area of interest, which is environmental studies. And she wrote a fascinating research paper on um, how to use data to effectively study the quality of the world's oceans. Um, and that was a pretty significant academic achievement that she could then talk about on her college applications and beyond. The final option is to use research as a way to switch tracks entirely. And this is something that happens that you spend, you know, the early years of high school thinking you're interested in a particular area, but then you decide later on that you want to switch tracks and apply to something else entirely. That's a tricky position to be in because you don't have enough in that area to show on your application. So this student was someone, uh, this student is a bit older. So um, he was actually in an undergraduate degree already and wanted to apply to a master's degree. But his undergraduate degree was in me mechanical engineering, and he wanted to do a master's degree in business. So what he did was he wrote a research paper, and this was such an interesting research paper that um, did a case study analysis of a particular company that created low-cost ventilators when COVID hit. And so he combined his experience in engineering, so to go into the details of how that company was able to manage that shift technically, but then bring in the business perspective and use theories of low cost innovation to explain how this company was able to innovate so effectively. And so he ended up going to um, Columbia University in the US where he's doing a master's in business. Um, but this could be in, in a high school context that you spent the early years doing very STEM focused subjects, but then deciding that you want to apply to um, a university program in political science or business and using research as a way to bridge those interests and, and, and um, go from what you were previously uh, strong in to build up expertise in another area. So I think all of these are ways that students have successfully used research and you can do. So I see a couple of questions in the chat. Um, Yi says, 
what do you think I should pursue which is significant and will interest Cambridge and Imperial during your gap year? I think that's really hard to answer without knowing what you're applying for and what your background already is. So um, feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, I'm going to put it in the chat and we can talk about your specific case in more detail. But I think research could be a really powerful thing to do in a gap year because it's something pretty substantial and, and that helps you showcase, as I mentioned, both your academic interests as well as your initiative and college readiness. Mayim says, what would be a good way to begin a personal statement? Should I begin with a biography or straight away dive into the real explanation to my interest in research? I've seen people do both. Um, I think, I think uh, certainly you should avoid the, the uh, un, not unnecessary, but irrelevant bi biographical details like where you live or how many siblings you have, because none of those, either that's information that the university already has, they already know where you live, um, or that they don't really care about like how many siblings you have. So what you should think about, when you think about your personal statement, you should think about how do I convince this university that I am academically strong in the area that I'm applying to and that I will be able to make the best use of their university resources and use that as the structure. And from there, you might want to tie in biographical details or tie in personal characteristics, but with a view towards proving that you would be a good uh, fit for their university. Um, have a question from... Um, Tamas about how Lumiere can help with research. I'm going to talk about Lumiere in more detail in just a second. So hold on to that. And I see a Q&A about remuneration as well, which I will talk about. Um, Prachi asks, where can I share the research articles? Really good question. So um, some students will choose to publish their research. So you can apply to high school or college level publications, but by no means is that compulsory. So other ways that you can share your research articles are you could do a presentation of them for students at your school or at a conference or something like that. You could convert it into blog posts or articles that you submit in a, 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 in a blog, in a college, in a high school magazine, in a local newspaper, any of those things. You could also choose to not publish it anywhere and simply include it as a portfolio attachment, which a number of universities have started to now accept. Um, and finally, you could also show your research paper to your teachers at school and say, hey, could you write a little bit about this um, in your uh, 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 letter of recommendation that you write for me? Harvey says, are target universities important? I don't fully understand that question, Harvey. Do you mean, is it important to have a target university? Um, could you, if you could rephrase that question for me, I can try to answer that. Elvin says, about the personal statement for Oxbridge, is it really only or almost focusing on academic content or do we need to put some extracurricular activities and achievements on it? Um, once again, I think you should email the folks at uni admissions uh, for this. From my perspective and my understanding, um, I think the Oxbridge application is very, very strongly academically focused. So extracurricular activities are useful um, in demonstrating that you are good at that academic activity or as a way of providing a bit of context to say, I achieved all of this academic uh, uh, um, expertise and depth while also competing every weekend for the school uh, uh, swim team or school football team, which is which can be a way of showing that you're a really hard worker and that you have taken the initiative to learn about this subject. Um, and I think that that's something that's that's uh, that you could do, but in general, academic focus is important. Tomas says, I heard that publishing a research paper adds more value to your profile than just writing or presenting one. Is that true? So I think this is something that high school students are a little bit confused about sometimes. The actual process of publishing a research paper in a peer reviewed journal of the kind that, you know, PhD students or professors might write, might publish in will take years. You will spend, you know, a year or two writing and refining your research paper. You will then submit it. It'll go in for evaluation. That could take anywhere in the order of six to eight months. They'll come back with edits or they might reject you, in which case you have to make changes and resubmit. And so it's a very long and involved process. And that's the reason why, you know, I'm in a PhD at Oxford. And, and if, if I look at my classmates, the vast majority of them have only just started to publish work a couple of years into their PhD. So the expectation that high school students need to have published their work 
is simply not true. And I think colleges understand this. Um, you know, the kinds of people who are evaluating your applications are people like me, professors who are slightly older. And they know that publication is really hard and takes a really, really long time if you are doing it at a good quality publication. So in that situation, I think being able to show that you have done the research, written the paper, and that you have learned from it is good enough in the vast majority of cases. If you are submitting it to a publication, you need to make absolutely sure that you are not submitting it to a bad journal. So there are journals which are really shady and are what's called pay to play, which means that if you give them a few hundred pounds, they will publish your paper, no questions asked. Those actually hurt your reputation and hurt your application because it makes it seem like you are um, uh, uh, pretending to have a publication when you really don't. So the sweet spot is, well, either you spend years doing research and going through the peer reviewed publication process. And if you're able to do that, that's fantastic. Um, or there are also a number of high school and college level journals. So these are journals, for instance, there's one based out of the UK called uh, the Journal of uh, the Young Scientists Journal. Um, there's one called the Journal of Young Investigators. There's all of these high school level journals that have been set up with the specific goal of platforming the work of high school students. And I think those could be a place that you could submit to um, and that you have a reasonable chance of getting in quickly, uh, but also that have a selective um, evaluation process. So um, that's what I would consider, I would recommend you consider if you're thinking about publishing. Ebru asks, have private school students had a reduced chance of getting into Oxbridge? Not my area of expertise, um, so I'm not going to try to answer that question, Ebru, I'm sorry. Um, he asks, what is the latest research you can do to help you stand out in the medical field? I would say don't approach it from that um, angle because that falls prey to the, the second red flag that we talked about, which is universities looking and going, oh, this student is simply trying to do what's cool or what's in vogue in order to try and get it. Rather go into thinking about what is it about medicine that, that you're interested in? What diseases interest you? What parts of anatomy interest you? And from those areas of interest, identify a question that you're curious about that you can build a research paper around. And I promise you that that will result in a better experience and a better research paper that will contribute to your application than you starting from what is the latest research that will that'll help me stand out going, oh, maybe that is gene editing technology and then saying, now I have to write a paper about gene editing when in reality, you're not interested in genetics at all and you're more interested in pharma pharmacology or something else. So I would really recommend that you think about it from the perspective of interests rather than um, uh, simply what, what helps you stand out. Fantastic. So finally, after your research is done, think about how you can make the most of your research. Reflect on your experience, what it's meant to you and how it's helped you grow. Think about next steps, whether you want to pursue publication, presentation, other options, and also stay in touch with your mentor if you do it as part of a mentored program um, so that you can um, uh, continue to turn to them for advice and support and, and potentially even ask them for recommendation letters. And if that sort of excited you and, and you're thinking about research and you want to consider doing it with Lumiere, um, we would love to have you. Over the last year, we've had over 600 students from 30 different countries do the program. These students have gotten into six of the eight Ivy League universities, into Oxford, into Exeter, into LSE. So we've had some fabulous alumni so far, and we would love for you to join them as well. The way it works is we run four cohorts over the course of the year. Our summer cohort is coming up in June. We have a fall cohort that starts in September, a winter cohort that starts in December, and a spring cohort that starts in March. You apply through a written application that you can find in, on our website. So that's lumiere-education.com. If you are shortlisted for an interview, we then um, dig deeper into your interests and try and understand why you want to do the program. You're then matched with a mentor. And our mentors are all current PhD candidates or postdocs at top research universities in the US and, and the UK. So you can imagine the sort of Oxbridge, LSE, Imperial, um, the Ivies, uh, the UCs, the universities of California, Duke, Rice, those, those types of universities. Once you're matched with a mentor, you then kick the program off. And over the course of 12 weeks, 
you're meeting with your mentor one on one once a week for about an hour. The initial weeks are kind of exploratory. So the mentor is assigning you papers to read or tasks to do with the goal of helping you um, identify what within that area excites you the most. You then pick a specific research question and dive into it for the rest of the program. So from about week four till the end of the program, you're working on writing your 5,000 word paper and, 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 and turning it into something that you can really be proud of. At the end of it, the mentor writes you an evaluation. Uh, we have a graduation ceremony where we celebrate you and then we send you off into the wild. In terms of the costs of the program, the individual program, which is a 12 week program costs 2,400 US dollars. And then we have two longer programs that cost $4,300 and $7,600 respectively. In the publication program, we're helping you identify a target publication and submitting to it. Of course, we don't assure publication because that depends on the target that you're submitting to, but our goal is to help set you up to success in that process. Um, and finally, in the fellowship program, this is for students who are really looking to invest um, a significant amount of time and energy into research that can take anywhere between six to 12 months. And you have up to 30 meetings with the, re with the, with the mentor. And the goal is really to do something pretty substantial in the area there. So that's what the fellowship program looks like. If you're looking to apply for the summer, our next deadline is coming up in the middle of April, so April 17th. You can apply through our website, um, but if the summer is not the right time for you, you can also apply uh, to one of our future cohorts. Um, there'll be more information on that um, going up on our website very soon. Um, in the meantime, if you have any other questions, please feel free to email me. Um, I'm putting my email and our brochure in the chat. But otherwise, I hope that was useful. Um, I hope that was interesting. And uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, research really has changed the trajectory of mine and Stephen's lives. And I hope you join us in, in this journey and give it a chance to change yours as well.